Welcome to Dermatologically Tested, the podcast of the British Association of Dermatologists, aka the BAD. On this podcast, we'll be exploring the world of our skin with a range of dermatological experts, tackling topics from the clinical to the cosmetic. I'm Matt Gass, and with me is my co-host, Nina Goad. Our topic today is adult acne, and I know that there's a huge amount to talk about, and we have a wonderful guest. So I think rather than us chatting on, it's best if we just get started. Yeah, perfect. Let's crack on. So our guest today is Dr. Anjali Marto, consultant dermatologist. Anjali was a major contributor to the BAD's Acne Support Project, a website aimed at providing expert information on all aspects of acne. Hi, Anjali. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hi, Anjali. Lovely to hear from you. So I guess first things first, what would be really useful to learn is what actually causes acne and how it comes about in the first place. Yeah, so um, acne, I mean, it's a very common skin condition and it's got a number of factors that result in its development. So it's multifactorial, but all acne essentially develops from what we call the pilosebaceous unit. Now, the pilosebaceous unit is a hair follicle and it's attached oil gland to it. And what happens as we hit puberty is our bodies start to produce a lot of hormone, in particular hormones known as androgens. So these are hormones like testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, DHT, and even women produce these hormones. And what these hormones do is they increase the size and the activity of our oil glands. If your oil glands are larger, plumper and juicier, they start out throwing more oil onto the skin surface. Alongside that, our skin cells along the hair follicles become very sticky and they start to stick to each other. So a process called follicular hyperkeratinization. So this combination of excess oil production, sticky skin cells can result in blockage of the pore where the hair follicle opens up onto the skin surface. Once that pore is blocked, you can develop blackheads or whiteheads, what we call comedones in sort of the scientific literature. And once these comedones form, bacteria, which live on the skin surface, can then act on those to create deeper spots. So those red bumps that you get underneath the skin, painful, last for days, never come to a head. So it's a combination, really, between excess oil, hormones, sticky skin cells and bacteria which live on the skin surface. That's fascinating because I think a lot of people assume that the trigger for acne is bacteria. And don't know that actually that comes at a later stage in the development. People just think it's because I haven't washed my skin properly. I've got too much bacteria on my skin. But what you're saying is that actually there are hormonal reasons that are almost beyond our control in some ways that will start the process. And bacteria is just one part of that process. That's absolutely right. You know, you can't catch acne. It's not an infection. You know, if you share a towel with somebody that's got acne, you're suddenly not going to catch it from that person because that bacterial component is a very small part of it. And it's an inflammatory component rather than an infective component. So you can't give it to somebody else. Yeah, I think that's a really important myth to dispel. Would you be able to tell us a bit more about adult acne? Because obviously it is a problem that persists for many people beyond the teenage years. That's right. And and it's interesting. If you look at the scientific literature, there's no clear clinical guidelines between what makes the difference between adolescent acne and adult acne. So we kind of use it roughly to describe acne between the ages of 20 to 25 years onwards. So um, it's inconsistent in terms of the exact age that we use. But roughly, if you're getting acne beyond your teenage years, you fall into that adult category. Is it still considered adult acne if it's a continuation of your acne from your teenage years? Say you you never really had it go away and it's it's still there. Is that would that still be adult acne or is that I, I don't know quite how you define it? Yeah, so no, that's a really good question, actually. So if we look at just figures of acne in general in the population, so about 85% of adolescents will suffer with acne. But once we get beyond the age of 20 to 25 years, you're looking at about 20 to 40% of women that will continue to have spots and a much smaller percentage of men, so about 3 to 8% of men. And the difference between the genders is largely thought to be due to women having complex hormonal monthly cycles. 
But then if you look at the adult category itself, that can be broken down also. And about 80% of those that have got acne beyond the age of about 20 to 25 years will have persistent acne. So what that means is they had acne in their teenage years that has continued to grumble on and has never gone away. Then you've got another 20%, so definitely the minority, who had great skin as a teenager and developed acne for the first time as an adult. So even the adult category can be split into persistent and new onset. Does adult acne tend to look the same as teenage acne or is it a different clinical entity altogether? Does it look different? So again, good question. And what I would say is all acne is down to sort of individual hormones, genetics and the interplay between those. And from a pathology point of view, it does seem to be part and parcel of the same issues that you're having with increased hormones such as androgens, sticky skin cells, excess oil production and an interaction of the bacteria which live on the skin surface. If you look at the pattern of the acne itself, though, there are some studies that suggest that with teenage acne, you often see T-zone acne. So the forehead, the nose and the chin being oily, prone to blackheads. But in adulthood, it seems to be that there is more of a U-zone pattern. So acne, which affects the lower half of the face, often around the jawline, the top of the neck, the chin, the lower part of the face. But all of the clinical studies haven't been consistent on this finding, although a lot of women will report that most of their acne is related to the lower half of the face. Is there a clear definition between just some spots and acne, or is it down to sort of your individual perception of it or how long it lasts for? Yeah, you know, I think this a lot really comes down to the fact that doctors and medics like to label things. So acne is just the medical word for spots. And spots is more, I guess, what, you know, the general public would use to describe a collection of blackheads or red bumps known as papules or pustules. But in actual fact, it's all acne. Um, acne is just the medical word that we tend to use, the medical definition that we tend to use for it. Yeah, because I, I get the odd outbreak here and there, and I, I wouldn't consider myself as somebody that has acne. Yeah. But it's not, there's not that sort of clear line. But that's really interesting. So you've talked a little bit about the differences between men and women, but are there other groups that are, that are more prone to adult acne? Is there sort of a difference between different ethnic groups um, or, or different times in your life when you're more susceptible? Yes, if we look at ethnicity for acne, the, the data is actually very limited. And this partly comes down to the fact that a lot of clinical trials that take place often don't take place on darker skin types. So I don't think that I can give you a definitive answer to that simply because we don't know. From a kind of lifestyle and sort of during different ages of one's one's lifetime, yes, there certainly can be a difference. So particularly in women, and again, I think it's because women have so much more hormonal stuff going on. Not only is there a monthly variation due to your menstrual cycle, but there's also a variation due to other things like pregnancy or the menopause as well. So it's very common for acne to flare in the first trimester of pregnancy. And that often can occur because there is a higher level of another hormone called progesterone, which has got similar effects to androgen hormones, which drive acne. So a lot of women will notice a blip when they first get pregnant, but often the skin will settle in the second and third trimester. The same with approaching the menopause. It's very, very common for women to develop acne around that perimenopausal period. And that's related to the fact that as a woman approaches the menopause, her levels of estrogen will start to fall. But women have lots of other hormones other than estrogen and androgen hormones or testosterone are the other hormone that they have. And what happens as you approach menopause is whilst the estrogen levels fall, testosterone levels in a female will stay relatively constant. So the ratio or the difference that you have around menopause between those testosterone and estrogen levels is much, much higher, which therefore results in the development of acne during that stage. I think it's really interesting what you said about, or well, interesting is not necessarily the word, perhaps depressing, um, what, what you said about the lack of research for different skin types and, and, yeah. and how acne affects different ethnicities. Because so I think that's a recurring theme, and I think it will be a recurring theme anyway, that there just isn't enough research 
or comparable research for you know different ethnic groups, skin of color um, in in dermatology. And it's something that we would want to definitely say again and again is please do more research into skin of color. And because it's hard to make um, provide good evidence based advice for people if if there isn't the scientific research. A hundred percent. I don't think a one size fits all message is particularly helpful. The other thing as well with skin of colour, particularly when it comes to acne, is if you haven't seen a lot of it, and this is just something I noticed from training, but if you've trained in London, you're used to seeing skin of colour because you will have rotated through a hospital that you will see all ethnic groups. If you have trained in, I don't know, the, the north of Scotland or, you know, Devon, for example, you will see less skin of colour. And for conditions like acne, one of the big issues that skin of colour will get is the pigmentation afterwards, which is just as distressing for the ethnic sufferer of acne, not just the spots, but the discoloration afterwards. And if you can see lots of discoloration on the skin, even if a patient comes and sees you on the day and they haven't got that much active acne, the fact that they've got that level of pigmentation shows that their acne has been inflammatory enough at some point that you need to treat it quite aggressively. And I think that's often overlooked. Yeah, that's a really good point and, and something that people might not be aware of. The BAD actually has some plans on this front, which we hope will help dermatologists and, and other doctors who don't necessarily get as much exposure to different uh, skin types, perhaps because of the area that they practice in. I think what a lot of people will be tuning in, in for is your advice on, on what they should do if they start having issues with adult acne. Um, perhaps you could sort of give a, a bit, bit of an overview from, from what their first steps should be and, and what the process is that they go through. So acne is very common. And one thing that we know is, you know, when you start to develop spots, the first thing that you're very likely to do is look at over the counter measures. So skincare and products that you can potentially use to help reduce that acne or that oil production. So there are certain skincare ingredients that can be particularly helpful in reducing oil, particularly on the skin surface, block it well, essentially making sure that you've cut oil from the pore itself. So what I would recommend is if you start getting the odd few spots, it's worthwhile looking for things like face washes, cleansers, toners that have got ingredients like benzoyl peroxide, salicylic acid, niacinamide, alpha hydroxy acids like glycolic acid and lactic acid, vitamin A and zinc. And all of these are readily available in loads of different formats over the counter. I think once you've been doing that for a few weeks, if your acne is not getting any better or if it's increasing in severity, so rather than just, say, affecting one body area, it's starting to affect multiple body sites, so the face, the back and the chest. If your acne is starting to scar or leave indents or lots of pigmentation or if it's starting to affect your mental health and how you feel, it's stopping you wanting to go out, socialise all of those are then signs that maybe moving on from skincare, it is worthwhile seeking professional help. And at that point, it's worthwhile going and having a conversation with your GP who may be able to give you prescription creams or tablets. I think it's really difficult for people to, to know at what point to go to the GP. So I think it's really helpful to spell it out. I think for something like acne, I mean, it's common with a lot of dermatological conditions, but I think with acne, people are often quite reluctant to go see their GP. And they don't really know at what stage is it considered severe enough that I should go. That's right. And I think one of the reasons for that, actually, is the way that the beauty industry and the skincare industry market acne is they market it as a cosmetic issue rather than a medical one. So people often fall into this trap of thinking, I'm going to go and buy this skincare. They spend loads of money on that, find it doesn't work, waste another two months, try a different product because they think that, you know, it's all about getting the right face wash and it's because they haven't got the right cleanser or face wash or toner. That's why things aren't improving because we're just not seeing it for the fact that it is a medical condition that requires medical treatment. Outside of medical treatments, is there anything that people can do to help manage their acne, be it lifestyle tips or, you know, makeup or anything like that? I think in terms of lifestyle, you know, there's no superfood that you can have to fix your skin. A diet that is good for your skin is a diet that is good for your general health. But one thing that crops up over and over again is the relationship with diet and acne. And this is interesting because this relationship has been a very controversial one pretty much since day dot as far as dermatology is concerned. 
And what we do know is that over the past 10 years or so, there has been a little bit of emerging evidence that for some people, now this is not everyone, but for some people, diets high in refined sugars, so foods with a high glycemic index, can potentially drive acne in some people. The idea being that if you eat a really sugary food, that will cause a spike in your blood sugar or your blood glucose levels. If you get a spike in your blood glucose levels, that triggers another hormone called insulin, and that spikes. And that spike in insulin then leads to a spike in a third hormone called insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. IGF-1 functions in the skin very similarly to testosterone in some ways, and it can increase the size and the activity of the oil glands. And again, if those oil glands are bigger, you pump out more oil, your pores get blocked, and spots can form. So for some people, limiting sugar can be helpful. I am not keen on restriction, though, because I think that a lot of people can end up cutting out lots and lots of foods from their diet, develop issues around eating and food restriction, but their acne doesn't get any better either. So I would say reduce your sugar levels, but that's good for your general health, not just your skin. And if there's skin benefits, that's great. The second thing is dairy. And there seems to be weaker evidence for dairy than sugar. But it seems to be, again, in some susceptible people, not everyone, dairy in particular, it seems to be skimmed milk rather than full fat milk, can also drive acne in some people. Now, if it was as simple as cutting out dairy, we wouldn't have vegan patients. And all dermatologists will say they have vegan patients with acne. So I would say if you think there is a trigger with foods, it's worthwhile limiting. But if you do not see a pattern, you're probably the vast majority where that diet doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Okay, that's encouraging for people, I think, to know that they don't necessarily have to cut out any food groups. What are your thoughts on smoking and adult acne? Is there any known link there? Yeah, so the data seems to suggest an association between smoking and adult acne, particularly comedonal acne or blackhead type acne. But again, associations don't necessarily mean there is a cause and an effect. So what I would say is, again, my advice is smoking is not good for your general health. Your skin will also probably benefit from not smoking as well. So, I, you know, my advice there is don't smoke if you can avoid it. But if you're doing it simply for your skin, there's an association. But I don't think we can 100% say that smoking is the only causative factor. One thing we haven't talked about so far is scarring. And I was looking on the acne support website and I hadn't previously realised just quite how many different types of scarring there are that are linked to acne. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. With acne scarring, about 20 to 30 percent of people that suffer with acne will develop scarring. People that develop scarring often will develop it partly because they may have a family history of it partly because of the severity of the acne itself. So they may be getting nodules or cysts, which are the really deep red painful bumps underneath the skin that last for weeks on end. Or it might be that they just scar easily. That's just the way that they've been put together. And what I would say is when it comes to acne scarring, there's a lot of confusion about what constitutes scarring and what doesn't. So the first thing I'd say is if you are getting staining in the skin, so you're getting brown marks or red marks that a spot is leaving behind, but it's flat, that is not true acne scarring. That is what we call post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So brown marks, which you often see in darker skin types, or post-inflammatory erythema, which is the red marks that you often see in fairer skin types. But if they're flat, then treatments like chemical peels, ingredients like glycolic acid, lactic acid, and vitamin A can all help fade those. If you've got true acne scarring, what you're talking about is basically indents or divots in the skin. So you can see the skin surface isn't flat, it's irregular as the light hits it. And there are different types of acne scarring. The indented types, you can get ice pick scars, which look like little holes in the skin, you can get rolling scars where the skin surface just isn't flat, but it's just kind of gently going up and down. And then you can get boxcar scars, which are the slightly more deeper scars, which look like little craters in the skin. And those three types of scarring usually do require basically intervention where something is 
done that damages the skin surface to create a wound healing response, which promotes the formation of new collagen, that protein which gives your skin its support structure to plump out the indented areas. So you're talking about treatments like microneedling or laser or surgical treatments like subcision, where a needle is put underneath the skin surface to release the tethering down of the scar. But the right treatment depends on the extent, the severity, the site of the scarring, and often we combine lots of different treatments. And often on top of that, it takes time to see results. Your body takes at least three months to produce new collagen. So if you go in for scar treatments, you're not gonna notice a benefit in a week or two weeks. You're in it for the long haul. It will take a minimum of three months before you notice any benefit. And then there is another type of scarring known as keloid or hypertrophic scarring, where you've got bumpy scarring on the skin. And this is very common on the jawline, on the chest and the back. It's also more common in darker skin types. So Asian and black skin, you see it more frequently. And for that type of scarring, what you're talking about is things like steroid injection or surgical removal of the scars. So I guess just running through that, it's quite clear. There's lots and lots of different type of scarring. There's lots of different modalities of treatment. And often we will combine modalities of treatment depending on the patient. And are there any tips for preventing scarring occurring in the first place if you have acne? Yeah, so I think my two big tips for prevention of acne scarring. Number one, and people know this, but they do it anyway, is do not pick your spots and do not squeeze your spots and do not play with them. If you pick and squeeze your spots, there is a risk of driving inflammation deeper in the skin and damaging the deeper layers of the skin, which can result in indentation. So that's the first big thing. The second one actually is try and get your acne treated early because the longer it's left untreated and the more severe it becomes, the higher the likelihood of scars. And this is where the difficulty arises, I think, because it is not easy for everybody to get their acne treated early enough. And, you know, I, I sometimes feel like we treat acne a little bit backwards. We only give medications out when somebody has got acne severe enough and it's scarring enough that they deserve the right treatment. And actually we should be aiming to catch people before that scarring process develops. I mean, I think that's that's really interesting. And I think a lot of um, a lot of people would agree with that. They would like to be seen earlier and have better outcomes. But I also appreciate it's challenging because of the pressures on the on the health service and so on. Do you have any tips for people on covering their acne? Yes. Yeah, so in terms of whilst you've got acne, whilst you're waiting for it to be treated, potentially, there are things that you can do. And one of the things that actually the, the scientific data backs and, and shows is that wearing makeup in acne sufferers can have a massively positive effect on people's self-esteem. So that's one thing that I, I do actually advocate, that I think that if you feel self-conscious about your skin, makeup can be an absolute lifesaver and camouflaging it can be an absolute lifesaver. Because let's face it, you know, the majority of people will get acne on their face. That is the most visible part of their body. And it's totally understandable that it would therefore make somebody feel self-conscious about how they look, how they feel, how they interact with others. So the first thing that one can do is you can buy green tinted primers and green tinted primers are a type of, I guess, makeup. And what they do is green neutralizes redness. So if you apply a green tinted primer to any red areas, so red spots or red marking that you've got, it will reduce the appearance of that redness. So that's quite a handy thing for somebody that doesn't want to wear proper makeup, like foundation or concealer or something heavy to cover it up. This stuff is just bright green and you squirt it out of a tube and you can put it on your skin and it can neutralize it without looking like you're wearing makeup. For women, it's much more cosmetically acceptable to wear makeup. And there are some really good bases like foundations and concealers that one can look to buy to camouflage. When you're looking to buy products, go for things that are water-based rather than oil-based. Also look for things ideally that are long wear, so they will last sort of eight hours or 10 hours, so you can be confident that you've applied it in the morning and you don't have to be worrying every hour that your makeup hasn't come off. And you're looking for products that have the label non-comedogenic. So this literally means will not block pores. So light textures, Long wear, non-comedogenic, water-based makeup can be really helpful. And there is data that supports its use in terms of improving self-esteem of acne sufferers. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important, um, the self-esteem point. I think there are, there's some great people who are um, 
talk about skin positivity and um, yeah. being really open about the issues they've had. And I think that's fantastic. But I also think it's not for everybody. So I think it's really important to sort of give people good advice about how they can they can cover their acne in a way that means they can go about their day without feeling so self-conscious, um, but also do it in a way that isn't going to make their, their acne worse. So I think that's great. And I'd also like to say for any guys listening that um, if you are having sort of self-esteem problems or, or you're concerned about your acne, it's stressing you out, then I think listening to, to some advice on covering it up is, is great because it shouldn't just be a thing that that's an option for, for women because it's a bit more the norm for them to, to apply stuff like makeup. Just go for it. Whatever works for you is the most important thing. I should jump in here and just mention that on acnesupport.org.uk, which is a website that was created by the British Association of Dermatologists, and Angie, I know you've been very involved in that, there are some really good tutorials on covering acne um, as well as a whole other wealth of information. But if you're not used to wearing any sort of skin cover or makeup, it can be quite a good starting point because I think sometimes more generalized um, tutorials that you might see on YouTube are aimed at people with flawless skin. And if you try and recreate those looks, actually sometimes it can draw more attention to any sort of um, red areas of skin or flaky bits where you've had perhaps an acne treatment on and actually do more harm than good. Yeah, we've got some brilliant videos on there, so people should definitely check those out. We had input from makeup artists and skin camouflage experts. Yeah, it's a brilliant resource. So, Anjali, it would be really good to circle back to a point you were making earlier about self-esteem and mental health. I'd be interested in getting a better understanding of how common these issues are in people with acne. I think generally there's a good understanding that acne tends to get people down or that they are not happy necessarily with their appearance when they have an outbreak. Um, But it'd be great to drill into that topic just a little bit deeper. Yeah, so I mean, the the first thing is, the longer that somebody suffers with acne, the more likely it is that they're going to have some kind of long-term damage to their own self-esteem. So the issue with acne itself is, not only does that outbreak that you get lead to kind of feelings of shame and anger and frustration, It has been associated with higher rates of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and also acne sufferers to some degree may be suffering with an issue of body dysmorphia as well. The other issue that comes with acne is not only you dealing with the active breakout, but because it is a chronic condition, you're also living with the uncertainty of when it might flare up again. So even if your skin is going through a good period, you may not want to commit to a social event in, say, three weeks' time because you don't know what your skin is going to do. So you're still also paranoid, even when it's good, about when it's going to break out next. The other thing that we know is not only does acne make you feel miserable, but people view acne sufferers in a fairly negative light as well. And there is data that backs this up that shows that, you know, acne sufferers are negatively perceived. People do say, well, you know, they're less attractive or they seem less mature or not old enough to be doing their job. And there is a degree of teasing, bullying, harassment, and even more so online now as well with the skin condition itself. So not only is the sufferer having to deal with how they feel about it, But then they're also dealing with how others perceive them and unsolicited advice that often comes as a result of it as well. So you've mentioned some of the psychological impacts that people with acne face. And can I just say that it's really disappointing to to hear some of the snap judgments that you mentioned. I think there's there's more than enough pressures uh, living with acne as it is. But perhaps you could um, explain to us exactly how common these uh, psychological issues are for people with acne. I refer most of my patients to a clinical psychologist um, because they all need it, it is the honest truth. Like they, they all will benefit so much from it. There was also a really interesting paper that came out a couple of months ago that said about t- up to 10% of acne sufferers have got a degree of body dysmorphia. And I can totally believe that as well, just based on some of the people that I see, because even though the acne clears up, people still associate themselves with being that spotty person. That's still what they see in the mirror even though the spots have cleared. So I think there are so many psychological issues that are tied up in that. The other thing is with acne, the severity is not a marker of how much it will affect your mental health. So with psoriasis, there is a direct correlation. The worse your psoriasis is, the worse your mental health would be. But with acne, you could have really minor acne, but it could be the worst thing in the world to you. And I find that really fascinating. The, um, clearly the patient cohorts are quite different in that way. 
with acne as well is I think there's different pressures for different people and maybe you can speak from your experience on this but I think with adult acne a lot of people that I talk to about it sort of say well I suffered from acne when I was or I had acne when I was a teenager and I was always told as a teenager this is just a teenage thing this will pass it will get better don't worry about it and then they they get to their 20s their 30s and beyond and they're still having to deal with it and it's just mentally draining yeah Oh, and the other thing as well, actually, that we haven't covered anywhere is the other problem with female adult acne, particularly, is they've got higher treatment failure rates. So if you're still suffering with acne as an adult, you actually do need to manage the patient and just say, chances are this is not going to be a permanent cure for you, because we do know that treatment failure rate is much higher. So something like 30 to 40 percent of adult women that will take isotretinoin or Roaccutane for their acne will relapse. And that's quite a high percentage. That's over a third that their acne will come back. So if you don't set that expectation up, that is going to lead to people feeling vulnerable and depressed and not understanding or feeling like they're in control of their skin. I think that's really important, actually. You're right, because I think there's that amazing relief that people get when their acne improves enormously. And it's hard not to feel like, right, job done. I I don't have to worry about that anymore. And the idea of it coming back would be very stressful, but it's better to know and to be aware of that than to have to deal with the trauma of going through it again. That's right. And I think the other group, actually, that in fact, I was thinking we've not touched on either, but lots of women will go on the combined oral contraceptive pill from their teenage years. They often stay on the pill for 10, 15 years. They get to normally around their late 20s, early 30s and think, oh, I wonder what my cycles are like now. I'm going to stop the pill and I'm going to see. And then within about three months, they get acne. And the reason for that is all those years they've been on the pill, the pill is a treatment for acne. It's been suppressing that tendency towards it. And then they suddenly come off the pill at, you know, 28, 29, 30, 31, and they've got acne and they're just like, I don't understand what's happened. And some of that also is pulling the contraceptive and the skin is going back to doing what it needs to do. And then you run into the challenge then of the fact that a lot of these women are of reproductive age and they are thinking about maybe starting a family during that period. And a lot of the medications and drugs that we use are teratogenic, i.e. they can cause birth defects. So you would not want to give them to somebody that's thinking of conception. So you then also have to navigate around that as well for particularly those women of that age. So there's so many factors that you need to take into consideration for a female adult versus a teenager. I mean, I think that's just a a whole other challenge that I hadn't actually considered. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. It's it does feel like a bit of a minefield, but I think that's the importance of good information. I think if you're armed with information to help you understand your condition and understand how to advocate for yourself and how to be that, what stage do I go to my GP? What stage do I uh, stop taking a treatment that's not working for me? Um, I think all that information is really useful for uh, people with acne so that they can can make good decisions for themselves and and advocate for themselves um, and and have a degree of control in what is is quite a difficult condition to, to navigate. No, I agree with that. I kind of feel that the role of the dermatologist is to be able to give options, pros, cons of those options and the alternatives. But ultimately, you want your patient to be able to make an informed choice on their life and where they're at now and where they might be in three, four, five years time so they can decide for themselves what the right treatment for them is. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And I actually think that's a perfect note to end the episode on. But thank you so much for joining us today, Angela. You've been so interesting to talk to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. It's been really informative. No, I appreciate you having me on. So that was Dr. Angela Marto that we were speaking to. Um, I thought that was a really illuminating discussion and I think it highlighted what a challenge living with adult acne can be. I thought it was really interesting what Anjali said about the failure rates and how common it can be for, for women with adult acne to, to have a recurrence of their acne, which must be extremely frustrating and difficult to deal with. And I think she made a really interesting point there, which was that as long as people know that there is a chance that their acne might come back, their expectations are better managed because you can still then go on to be retreated. But I think if you think you're going to have this wonder cure and that's it for the rest of your life, that's going to be harder to deal with any recurrence of your acne than if you've been prepared by your doctor. So that's quite a good takeaway message for any clinicians who are listening, really, isn't it? 
Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, I just it must be such a kick in the teeth when you when you've shaken something like that off or you think you have and it comes back. And I think talking about cover up and, and, and things like that is really important. I mentioned that, you know, for guys it's it's something that's slightly overlooked. Especially as she um as Angela mentioned these green tinted primers and I I don't think that's something I was really aware of. I know when I was younger, when I was a teenager, you could get like green cover up, but they looked really chalky and awful. And I suspect that what Angela's talking about is something quite different. Um, and the idea that people could use something that doesn't make them necessarily look or feel like they're wearing foundation or makeup, but will still help ease some of that redness. That's a really good take home tip, I think. I'd come across it recently in, in Queer Eye uh, on Netflix, but I think it's a really good thing to get the message out on. I think as well, the conversation we had about the psychological challenges, I think it's, it's not something that's talked about enough with adult acne. It's something that's mentioned occasionally with teenage acne, though I think even there the conversation would be taken a lot more seriously. But I know you know a lot, a lot of my friends say how frustrating it is to just you know still be dealing with something that they thought was just going to be a teenage issue. Being told that something is just a cosmetic issue really just doesn't take into account the, you know, the environment that we live in and the world we live in, which is so based on our appearance. And as an adult with acne, you're not one of the majority. You know, lots of teenagers do suffer from acne and I'm not in any way undermining the psychological impact it has on teenagers. But there's less of a sense of being alone, I would imagine, than having it as an adult when so few of your peers have the same skin issue as you. And especially when you think it's something you should have grown out of, it just seems hugely unfair, really, doesn't it? Yeah, I agree. And and I, I imagine that the people that haven't had to necessarily deal with it to the extent that many people do in terms of uh, a moderate or severe level of acne where it's it is really having an impact on, on your appearance and your confidence and your self-esteem. Because um, I think it's quite a flippant thing to say. And unfortunately, you know, some people do lack that empathy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's not just about the effect that it has on your emotions. I think that's what we tend to talk about, you know, depression, anxiety and things like that. But actually on just on your life outcomes, because if you have something very visible like acne on your face as an adult, you may feel less prone to want to put up, you know, to speak out at a meeting or put yourself forward for things. And that in turn then has an impact on your career, on dating, on relationships, friendships, all sorts. Because sometimes you just don't want to, you don't even want to just draw attention to yourself, even in a work setting at a meeting. So I just think it's not just about your emotions. It's just about the impact it has across all aspects of your life, really. It can't be underestimated. And of course, that's not true for everyone. And it was really interesting what Angeli said that there isn't a, um, a scale of disease severity. So it's not necessarily that if you have more severe acne, that the impact is going to be as severe. You know, it, it can be completely different for different people. And I don't want to say, I don't want to generalise and say that acne is going to have a huge impact on everyone who has it, because for some people it's not a big issue. But then, of course, for some people it is. Yeah, I think that's that's a commonality that, that we'll probably see quite a lot throughout the episodes in that there's a lot of dermatological conditions and um, a lot of a lot of conditions that affect your appearance and some people are very relaxed about it it, it seems anyway they, they they can handle that aspect of the of a skin condition very well but that shouldn't diminish other people who who do struggle yeah I think you're right and I also think it's you're absolutely spot on that this is something that's going to become more and more apparent the more podcasts we do because it's something we've already touched upon when we did the podcast with Bav Shergill about aging um, about how it can affect people so differently and you know some people brush it off and some people don't you just can't trivialize anyone's reactions really and I think that's so true and even more poignant with visible skin diseases so yeah I think we're going to learn a lot more about that across all the different podcasts yeah exactly well We'll actually be talking about mental health in more depth very soon with a psychodermatology expert, Dr. Tony Bewley. And we'll be also looking at some more cosmetic skin issues. So there's a good mix of, uh, of things coming up. Um, I would just encourage people to uh, subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. My final point, and I'm plugging it again because it is a brilliant resource, make sure you check out Acne Support 
if acne has been an issue for you and you want to learn more. To find acne support, you just go to www.acnesupport.org.uk. We cover a huge array of treatments, causes, myths. We talked about covering your acne. Uh, that's covered there as well, as is scarring. So there's, there's loads of stuff on there. Um, so please make use of that. With that out of the way, thanks so much for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you catch us again in two weeks' time.